Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we assemble on the Sabbath day, shall we ask the Lord for his guidance as we open his word and the words of his prophets that we have accepted were written more for our time than for the time in which they were written? Shall we ask for his blessing, for his guidance and his watch care for us to carefully consider these items? And may we find the points that our Heavenly Father would have us to find. May we discuss these things amongst ourselves, both now in this meeting and for those that will watch this later. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for these hours of the Sabbath where we may rest, where we may come before you, where we may consider carefully the fact that we need to praise you, learn of you, be patient, and listen. Help us now, Father, as we open your word. Direct us in all things. May today's study and conversation be fruitful. Direct us now in all this. Please forgive us of our sins, Father. Guide us in the path that you would have us to walk. May it be your words that are spoken and not mine. May it be your character that is seen, and not mine. I thank you for each one that is attending this meeting today. Show us the things that we need, Father. Direct our steps, direct, direct our words, guide our thoughts. May your angels attend us. May your spirit be with us. For this we ask, Father. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we were stepping through some things this last week, we read from the pen of inspiration that we should be considering Haggai chapter 1, as well as considering Zechariah 4. Now, as these studies were being prepared, I was very surprised to note the number of references that Sister White has made of Zechariah 4, especially Zechariah 4 verse 6. Now, Haggai 1. As we see this before us, Haggai was written in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the hand of Haggai unto Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatel, captain of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. So these words are written to what class of people? The Jews that were living Babylon. Well, if the captain of Judah and the high priest are taken as one class, then who are these words written to? Levites. 
are they not written for leadership? Right. Now, if they are written for leadership, they are written as well for those that will lead at the very end of time. So we need to consider carefully many of the things that we see here. These words were written 222 years after Isaiah 7-9. And is Isaiah 7-9 important for us today? Yes. Okay. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, The people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. What is the house that is to be built today? So I suppose we are supposed to, you know, we're supposed to be part of that house, his, his, his temple. We are to be that house for, are we not to be part of the temple that is built with living stones, the temple that is built without hands? Amen. So then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, and this is backed up by Ezra 5.2, then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatil, and Yeshua, the son of Josedek, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. And with them were the prophets of God helping them. So if Zerubbabel is the son of Shittil. And we are here told that he is the captain of Judah. Is this not the civil leadership joining with the religious leadership together? Is this not showing us the unity that we are to have within this movement? Yes. Okay. So once, if, if we're reading this again from Ezra 5.2, then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Shittil, and Yeshua, or Joshua, the son of Josedek, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, and with them were the prophets of God helping them. So this is not just leadership. This is leadership and the people. Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? Is it time for us to say, I have a home to live in and leave God's house in disorder? No, not at all. Now, therefore, saith, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. We are to set our heart on our ways. Ye have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but there is none that are warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put into a bag withholds or he that earneth wages earneth wages to put into a bag pierced through
What does it mean to you to place your worldly compensation in a bag that is pierced through? Are you able to keep it? No, it can't be. Like you can be working for in vain. Right. Nothing can do us real good without the blessing of God. What God blesses is blessed. Therefore, a little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. Psalm 37, 16. The little with the blessing of God is more efficient and it will extend farther. The grace of God will make a little go a great ways. When we devote ourselves to the affairs of the kingdom of God, he will mind our affairs. The word of God says of them who devoted their interests solely to their own affairs, you have sown much and you bring in little. You eat, but ye have not enough. You drink and ye are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but there is none that are warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. When God smiles upon our efforts, it is worth more than any earthly income. Now, brothers and sisters, the invitation is given freely. The invitation is given to us to come to study together, to learn of God, and to freely present that which we are learning. We are going to find many that are going to choose not to study in any manner. They are going to be self-satisfied in their own ideas. They're going to be self-satisfied in the way in which they are proceeding. None of us have all of the light. We need individually to understand our duties and our privileges. The things suffered and enjoyed are full of meaning. And if we take heed to God's holy precepts, we shall prove in our character that we have known the things that which make for our peace. The entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. The expression simple does not mean those that are deficient in intellect, but those who have the simplicity of a child willing to learn of its parents that is willing to be teachable and obedient. They will discern the requisitions of divine truth and their prayer will be, O Lord, do thou teach us how to learn of thee, that we may be wise in thy wisdom and happy in doing thy will in obedience and in love. There is a lot to be said here. Now, we're going to go back into this in Zechariah. As we noted this last week, in Zechariah 4.2, and he the angel, this angel, the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. Zechariah is being awakened. Is this a first time or a second time?
as we read this. And the angel that talked with me came again. Now, something has come again. That means he's come at a time previous. Correct? Mm -hmm. Is that is that point correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I won. And wake me. And here is Daniel in Daniel eight eighteen. Does Daniel eight mean anything to us today? Mm -hmm. Very much. Okay. Because Daniel, now as he, as Gabriel was speaking to me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me upright. Here is Zechariah being awakened as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. Are we not given other instances within scripture of those that would be awakened out of their sleep? And what do they mean to us? Coming to an understanding. Okay. But... <clears throat> Were not there 10 virgins that were all asleep? Yes, there were 10. Five wise and five were, were foolish. But all of them were asleep and all needed to be awakened. Yeah, true. So now we're being asked. And they said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked and beheld a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl on the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees beside it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. And he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And the alternate reading would bring this to not by army, nor by power, but by my spirit. Now, is the word of the Lord to be accomplished by the devisings of man? Yeah, another thing about that word might Go ahead. Um, can also just refer to uh, virtue um, that is not by our own righteousness. So is the word of the Lord to be accomplished by our righteousness? No. How did the rest of you see this? No, like it can't be. It cannot be. Because how can something of sin accomplish that which God has ordained. Now, 
there are multiple pages in this document that are going to address points that Mrs. White was shown regarding this one verse. We are going to be addressing the olive trees. We are going to be addressing all that is to be seen for the lamps and what our responsibility, our great responsibility is. So in this, we should also consider that when it is being stated, not by might, that Hosea 1.7 was being shown to us as well. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah and will save them by the Lord their God and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, nor by horses, nor by horsemen. What does that say to you today? Uh, salvation comes from God and it's not by ourselves it's not by force of man at all because all our, our righteousness so called is filthy rags God wants us to agonize with him that his power may unite with our efforts that we may bring those into the truth who shall be an honor to his cause however poor they may be, if they have root in themselves, they can have an influence upon others. There are fields where there are souls who will respond to the truth, who will be shining lights. I have felt that it was best for us to pray and have living faith that God would direct us as to the manner of our labors. It is not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. It is a living connection with heaven, which brings the light and the power, which we can bring souls to Christ. Brethren, we want to act like living men and women. We want to put on the armor of righteousness. We are to know that as an army of workers, we have God as our captain. We are then prepared to meet principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Let us not sleep in the field of battle. May God help us to be wide awake, to be earnest and energetic in the precious cause of truth. Is this not telling us that we are acting like those that are dead? If we are being told now that we need to act like living men and women? What did we see from the dry bones that was denominated in the book of Ezekiel? For what are dry bones? Parts of dead bodies, skeletons. We're speaking literal dry bones, or are we speaking figurative dry bones? Brother Samuel, are you yet alive? Yep. Are you dead dry bones? No, I don't think so because I, I believe in Christ. Like I believe his gospel. So I don't think I'm dry bones. 
what I could think of that the dry bones could be those that don't accept Christ's gospel. Though they can be alive physically, but without the gospel of Christ, because God's word is the one that brings up life to somebody's soul. So we, when it's in its absence, means that somebody is, is dead. When we are connected with heaven, we are seeking to bring souls to Christ. Are those that are that have a living connection with heaven? Are they looking to cast out others or are they looking to bring people into this same relationship with Christ? To bring people into the close relationship with Christ. Amen. When we are looking and we are finding those that are being critical, that are not willing to be connected with heaven, then these are they that wish to remain asleep. We have not lost our faith in you or in the work, here she says, in England. We know that there's a great work to be done. The Lord has revealed to us that by the most simple means, he can do wondrously, as in the casting down of the walls of Jericho. His people then were to do as he told them, and God would do the rest. God so planned it that his name should receive all the glory. The same God is willing to work by whom he will. Again, we repeat, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. We need faithful Caleb's in the work at this time. We need Jesus, the captain of the Lord's host, to be with us. We need to follow his directions and to have faith in him. If we are following Jesus' directions, are we to be sharp and critical of other brothers and sisters? No, we're not supposed to. Thank you. We are fighting with unseen foes, more formidable than giants. It is hard to conquer the devil. He cannot be overcome with any weapon save, save the sword of the spirit. Oh, that there were a larger number who would speak for Jesus anywhere and always act for him. Have you ever, have you ever considered that point? That we are fighting these unseen foes that are more formidable than giants, that are more formidable than Goliath himself. Goliath was overcome with a stone. Goliath's pride placed him in the path of David, the youth, with his sling and his stones. Our adversary, the great deceiver, the father of lies, cannot be overcome with any weapon except for the sword of the spirit. Hold on to that thought. Another feature of the meeting was the bright, happy, cheerful faces that were pleasant to look upon and then the testimonies that were so cheerfully and gladly given, almost, universe, almost universally of a hopeful character. The hearts of many were brimming full and runneth over with gratitude 
that they had been blessed with the privilege of hearing the truth and with hearts ready to respond to the drawing influences of the Spirit of God. This is that which the true witness describes as the first love. So when we are looking at this, when we are being blessed by the privilege of hearing the truth of the scripture, and we have hearts that are ready to respond to the influence of the spirit, are we not returning to that first love that had been rejected so long ago? It was evident that these precious souls had something more than formality. How many times, brothers and sisters, on a Sabbath, do we meet together to hear someone else give a presentation? Do we meet just to see friends? Are we to have a formal religion, a formal faith, or are we to have a living faith? A living faith. Amen. They had spirit and life and the manifest ministration of the spirit. Where there is formality, the spirit cannot abide. Okay, we have a, a point from the chat. First Samuel 17, 25 to 47. And it states that this is a great affirmation of faith in the Lord of hosts, in whose battle we are engaged. What is the great controversy, brothers and sisters? Is the great controversy all about us? No. Thank you. I was presented with that question several years ago in a small Sabbath school, which I greatly enjoyed. And I answered in exactly the same manner. It shocked the person leading out. Because is not the great controversy about the character of our Heavenly Father and our Creator? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, it is, but we're all involved in it because it's a battle for souls. Christ wants to save us. Satan wants wants to curse and curse and ruin us and bring us to hell with him. But isn't isn't this controversy that our adversary would say that our heavenly Father, our Savior, is cold and exacting? That they care little exactly. for us. Amen. I agree with that for sure. Okay. All testimonies borne by ministers and lay members were explicit upon the point of disclaiming any pretension or power in themselves, in their most earnest reasoning, and in the proclamation of the truth, of conveying saving knowledge to any minds. The agency of the Holy Spirit of God alone could touch and subdue the human heart. So if the agency of the Holy Spirit alone is able to touch and subdue the human heart, can criticism, backbiting, or gossiping touch the human heart? Not at all. 
The necessity was urged upon all hearers to pray for divine illumination and to search the scriptures for themselves. We are to pray. We are to search. If we are unwilling to take these two steps, are we then Unwilling to receive the heavenly oil. All their most earnest efforts would prove an entire failure. Unless the Lord himself should by his divine power combine with the human agency. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. If they work after the perseverance and uniting energy, untiring energy of Paul, if they bring into their labors the eloquence and the melting and subduing love of Apollos, they must, as did those workers, not trust in their ability to accomplish the work, but do as they did, trusting alone in God to water the seed sown and to give the increase. We're being shown again not to trust in man. We're being shown not to trust in our own efforts. But we are to trust that God is able to lead, to water the seed, and to provide the increase that comes from it. From Manuscript 84 of 1891, a non-published manuscript, we find the following. The college was not brought into existence to bear the stamp of any one man's mind. Teachers and principals should work together as brethren. Here again, the people and the leadership should work together as brethren. They should consult together and also counsel with ministers and responsible men. And above all else, seek wisdom from above that all their decisions in reference to the important matters of the school may be such as shall be approved of God. Are we not right now involved in a Sabbath school? so that we may have open discussion, free discussion of the points being given before us. Are we not all to be learners? Are we all not to be at the feet of Christ? Yes, we are meant to be. Amen. They must not be corralled. They must not be compelled to act as the conference dictated and follow the exact plans laid out by them under all circumstances. When they see and know while engaged in the work that God would have them follow a different plan of action to meet the circumstances that arise. It must also be considered that God will work not always as men have planned. He often works in a mysterious way his wonders to perform, in a way that man has not calculated upon. The spirit of the Lord is not bound. He surprises men by revealing himself in his way. And again repeated, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. <clears throat> and who said this? The 
The Lord God. The Lord God. Men give the Lord but very little chance to work. Men try to tell God how the creator of this universe should work. That is a very sobering thought for me. They plan only in their line, in their way, not always in the best way and according to the best methods. But Christ has done a vast amount of planning which men need to bring into their plans. The promise of the great gift of the Holy Spirit was frequently on the lips of Christ. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. John 14, 26. The fulfillment of the promise is the infallible guide possessing power to transform all who accept the gift into spiritual worshipers, humble and beautified by the Son of Righteousness. They have an eye single to God's glory. Where are we to be today? Are we to have an eye to our own gain? Or are we to be looking that everything we do is to be to the glory of the name and the character of God Almighty. From Gospel Workers, 1892. <clears throat> the steady progress of our work and our increased faculties are filling the hearts and minds of many of our people with satisfaction and pride, which we fear will take the place of the love of God in the soul. Busy activity in the mechanical part of even the work of God may so occupy the mind that prayer shall be neglected and self-importance and self-sufficiency, so ready to urge their way, shall take the place of true goodness of meekness and lowliness of heart. The zealous cry may be heard, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these, Jeremiah 7, 4. Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord, 2 Kings ten sixteen. But where are the burden bearers? Where are the fathers and the mothers in Israel? Where are those who carry upon the heart the burden for souls, and who come in close sympathy with their fellow men, ready to place themselves in any position to save them from eternal ruin. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Ye are, said Christ, the light of the world. <clears throat> What does it mean to be the light of the world? What a responsibility is given to us at this time. There is need of fasting, of humiliation and prayer over our decaying zeal and our languishing spirituality. The love of many is waxing cold. The love of many have lost their first love. The efforts of many of our preachers is not what they should be. When some who lack the spirit and power of God enter a new field, they begin to denounce other denominations, thinking that they can convince the people of the truth by presenting inconsistencies of the popular churches. It may seem necessary on some occasions to speak of these things, but in general, it only creates prejudice against our work and closes the ears of many who might otherwise have listened to the truth. If these teachers were connected closely with Christ, they would have divine wisdom to know how to approach the people. 
they would not so soon forget the darkness and the error, the passion and the prejudice, which kept themselves from the truth. Is it your desire today to hold on to darkness and error, to hold on to your passions and your prejudice, and to keep yourselves from the truth that God would have you to understand? No. Now, I arise early. I have not slept since three o'clock, but did not leave my bed until past four. I find the inclination is almost irresistible to do a larger amount of writing and speaking than is prudent for my health. Here in 1893, Mrs. White <clears throat> is showing that she slept little in order to be able to write much. My head aches and I do greatly desire more than mortal energy to engage in the service of God. Here again, she repeats Zechariah 4.6. We may have ever so great earnestness and zeal, but unless the Holy Spirit is abiding with us, making a place for the truth in the hearts of the people, disappointment will mark all of our endeavors. We long for Jesus' presence. Without me, he says, you can do nothing. Thank the Lord for a pleasant day. Too much dependence is placed upon preachers, while the house-to-house -house work is much neglected. Paul, the faithful apostle, says, I have kept back nothing that is profitable unto you but have showed you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. <clears throat> Acts 20, 20, verses 21 and 26 to 28. We are to need and see our great need of repentance. And from repentance, to show our faith. We have a duty to repent and a action to show the fruits of our repentance, which is faith. I bow my soul in humility before God, seeking for that wisdom which he has promised to give to all who ask in faith. <laughs> in our daily habits, in our daily practices, we must be living exponents of sacred truth. My prayer is that the Lord may revive his work in the hearts of those who know the truth. Those who are laborers together with God will ever work in Christ's lines. Christ says, without me, you can do nothing. All the work we do for the conversion of souls will be effectual, not as we depend absolutely upon the presence and the power of heavenly intelligences. Not by might, 
nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Every versal that is meet for the master's use is clean and pure, emptied of self. Oh, for the refining, cleansing power of God that we may be used to his name's glory. We must not now falter, but press forward from victory unto victory. Can the Holy Spirit abide in a vessel that is not clean and pure? No. So when we have those that are choosing not to walk in God's manner, We are shown that the vessel has not the Spirit of God. You, under, you little understand the soul's great need and longing. Some are wrestling with doubt, almost in despair, almost hopeless you need to understand the fourth chapter of Zechariah. the two olive trees that stand in the presence of god empty through the two golden pipes the golden oil out of themselves into the golden bowl but from which the lamps of the sanctuary are fed the golden oil represents the Holy Spirit. This the heavenly messengers impart to the preachers of the word. The ministers of righteousness are to be continually replenished. That they in turn may impart to the church, giving it greater strength and efficiency. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Zechariah 4 6. The Lord's servants can obtain victories not by mere outward manifestations, but by inward purity, <clears throat> by cleanliness of soul, by heart piety, by holiness, which is wholeness to God. They are dependent upon the grace of God, presented by the holy oil emptied from the olive trees through the golden pipes into the golden bowl of the candlestick. <clears throat> so from the pen of inspiration, the golden oil that comes from the olive trees that stand in the presence of God is what? What is this oil? It's the Holy Spirit. So if we have not the golden oil, then we are lacking in the Holy Spirit. Would that be a correct statement? That's exactly. Brothers and sisters, does this not say that we are to be sporadically replenished with the Holy Spirit? Yes. That we are to be sporadically replenished. I thought it said we are to be continually replenished. Mm -hmm. Okay, the other way around, continually replenished. What does it mean to you to be continually replenished? To building up continually. That's according to me. Okay. 
Sister Angela, did you have a thought? Well, I know that I need him day by day, sometimes moment by moment. In fact, really, for the for the sake of life, always, <laughs> I just, always need God. Just sometimes moment by moment? Yeah, <laughs> I know. I caught myself there. <laughs> no, I'm realizing more and more that I need him every moment. And the last few days I've been pouring out, out to people and it's been exhausting. So it really reminds me. <laughs> the breath of the spirit needs to revive me. Okay. What can I say that shall make upon our ministers an impression never to be forgotten? The angels are present in the assembly where the word of God is preached. If this fact could be riveted in the mind of the speaker, <clears throat> with what awe, would be given utterance to the truth of God's word. Nothing is as precious in the sight of God as his church. There is nothing regarded with such jealous care. God is offended when his representatives descend to the use of cheap, trifling words. The cause of truth is dishonored. Men judge of the whole ministry by the man whom they hear, and the enemies of the truth will make the most of his errors. <clears throat> there are times, brothers and sisters, that there will be those that are going to say of us that we are hard, that we are uncaring, that we don't understand. We are to keep in mind at all times <clears throat> that as the word of God is spoken, that angels are present in that assembly. If we stand to criticize, if we stand to tear down, then whose work are we doing? The work of the anniversary. Exactly. God chooses men <clears throat> of a humble and contrite spirit through whom he can work and imparts to them his wisdom. When God is imparting his wisdom. Is he not imparting it to those vessels in whom the spirit of God can dwell? Yeah, that's right. They are little in their own eyes. And will not interpret success by the result of their own smartness, by the result of their own intelligence, but will give glory to God. They will glorify God. Not by might, nor by power, but by his spirit, saith the Lord. If men are entrusted with great responsibilities, this is no assurance of their fitness for their position. The assurance comes after test and trial. <clears throat> if they evidence that they sense their own weakness, if they make God their trust, the Lord will supply them with his wisdom. If they ask in faith, they will increase in knowledge and ability. 
if they depend upon God day by day, the stages of development will show a symmetrical growth heavenward. If they walk day by day in humility and contrition and wholeheartedness, in the strictest integrity, doing justice to their fellow men, showing reverence and honor to God by being obedient and true to him, keeping the living principles of righteousness, God will honor them. What does this say to you today, brothers and sisters? <clears throat> As Sister Angela said, we need moment by moment, minute by minute, hour by hour to make God our trust. The path of sincerity and integrity is not a path free from all obstruction. Do we find that there are holes in the road? Do we not find that there are times that we are being blocked? Do we not find that there are difficulties as we look to walk in this path? Very much. In the place of becoming faint-hearted and discouraged, those to whom God has entrusted responsibilities are to see in every difficulty a call to prayer. How often do we do this? How often when we are presented with a difficulty do we seek to pray? For is it not easier for us to pray than it is for us to complain? They are to consult not finite men who are boastful and show a masterly independence, but the great teacher who has given to every man his work in his vineyard. They are to be faithful workers, always in co-partnership with the great worker. They will not call slackly done work faithful and thorough service. They will stand fast against wrong, discerning the right from the wrong, the evil from the good. They will appreciate that which God estimates. There is no favoritism with God. And no partiality, no hypocrisy should be introduced or maintained in our households, in our churches, or our institutions. When Daniel was required to partake of the luxuries of the king's table, he did not fly into a passion neither did he express a determination to eat and drink as he pleased. Without speaking a single word of defiance, he took the matter to God. When did this occur within the book of Daniel? When was he presented to partake the luxuries of the king's table. I hope it's Daniel. I hope it's Daniel 1, 1. That's when maybe. Is it 6, 7, 7? Mm -hmm. If we are to look at this. Uh, 
Here is God. Here is Daniel before God. He is taken to Babylon and he is, Daniel is purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's food nor with the wine which he drank. And we find this in Daniel 1 verse 8. <clears throat> This, <clears throat> this chapter we have studied and have noted that it typifies what message? The first angel's message. The first angel's message. In the first angel's message, we are shown elements of all three messages, <clears throat> all four messages in truth. So when he was presented to partake and he was being required to partake of these lectures, he turned to God. He chose to fear God. He chose to give glory to him. For he understood that the hour of his judgment had come. He and his companions sought wisdom from the Lord. And when they came forth from the earnest prayer, their decision was made. With true courage and with Christian courtesy. Daniel presented the case to the officer who had them in his charge <clears throat> and asked that they might be granted a simple diet. These youths felt that their religious principles were at stake and they relied upon God whom they loved and whom they served. Their request was granted <clears throat> for they had obtained favor with God and with man. In all things, are we not to seek to do God's will? Yeah, that's right. Men in every position of trust need to take their place in the school of Christ and heed the injunction of the great teacher. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We have no excuse for manifesting one wrong trait of character. Here again, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. In your dealings with others, whatever you see or hear that needs to be corrected, first seek the Lord for wisdom and grace that in trying to be faithful, that you not be rude. Ask him to give you the gentleness of Christ. Then you will be true to your duty, true to your position of trust, and true to God, a faithful steward, overcoming natural and acquired tendencies to evil. None but a wholehearted Christian can be a perfect gentleman or a perfect lady. But if Christ is abiding in the soul, 
his spirit will be revealed in this manner. The words and the actions, gentleness and love, cherished in the heart, will appear in self-denial, in true courtesy. Such workers will be the light of the world. What does this say to us today? I look at this where it says that none but a wholehearted Christian can be a perfect gentleman. What does it mean to you today to be wholehearted? Brother William, are you yet here? Repeat the question. What does it mean to you today to be wholehearted? To be in Christ and him in you. I, I didn't quite hear you. Would you repeat that, please? I said to be in Christ and him in you. Does being wholehearted allow any of us to be sharp and criticizing of the actions of others? No, it does not. Okay. If we are being critical of others, if we are gossiping of others, Are we standing under the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel or are we under the black banner of the great apostate? And then we become the accuser of the brethren. Then. Right. So, brother, if we are an accuser of the brethren, are we a wholehearted Christian? No, you can't. Can't be. No, we're not. Have dark, they have darkness and light. Amen to that. In Battle Creek, much money has been expanded, which would have brought honor and glory to God had it been invested in foreign missions. Oh, how we have needed money in this mission. And still the interests are centering in Battle Creek. We need some of the facilities you have there, but no one feels a burden to spare some of your abundance. Oh, that the Lord would open blind eyes to discern what you have been doing. The Lord's treasures have been selfishly invested according to the devising of men to make a grand appearance to give character to the work. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. In giving character to the work, the Spirit of God will accomplish more than any expensive buildings. Difficulties have been accumulating for years. Pride has budded. This being written in 1896. If pride was budding at that time, is it not in full bloom today? It is. <clears throat> Going on to letter 12 of 1897. The attention of Elijah was attracted to Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who with the servants were plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. He was educator, director, and worker, far from city and court dis dissipation. Elisha had received his education. 
So, Elisha was far from the city. He was far from the courts of the king. And it was here that he received his education. Where did Christ and John the Baptist receive their education? Where did they receive their fitness for the work that they were to do? They were approved by the Lord above from heaven. Did they not receive their education in the home and from yes. nature? Yes, they did not attend uh, That's right. the schools from uh, Alexandria, but Antioch, which simply means uh, the spirit which was uh, leading the parents. They were uh, that's how they were being taught. Right. Not uh, with the schools which were coming from Alexandria, where the priests used to go and uh, get uh, the education from. Okay. The light. Excuse me. It says, and they also worked. So they weren't <laughs> idle, idle, idle minded. Correct. Did any of these. Elisha, Christ, or John the Baptist receive degrees from the teachers of their time? No, they, they, they didn't. We thought that uh, if uh, John had gone to those schools, it was going to be hard for him even to preach the message because he was going to compromise. Right. <clears throat> Praise God, brothers and sisters. For there are those that have sought these great decrees, these great degrees of men, these accolades of men. Yet there are those that are willing without those degrees to give the word of the Lord in as simple a manner as possible. Elisha had been trained in habits of simplicity, of obedience to his parents and to God. Thus, in quietude and contentment, he was prepared to do the humble work of cultivating the soil. But through a meek and quiet spirit, Elisha had no changeable character. Integrity and fidelity and the love and fear of God were his. He had the characteristics of a ruler, but with all that was the meekness of one who would serve. His mind had been exercised to be faithful in the little things, to be faithful in whatever he should do, so that if God should call him to act more directly for him, he would be prepared to hear his voice. This was the lesson he had learned, to be obedient. It is only those who render perfect and thorough obedience to God that he will choose. Consider this today. <clears throat> If we are not willing to render thorough obedience to God in the minor things, then we would not be chosen to do the work that he would have done. If any man in position of trust is in connection and association with men who do not obey God, who evidence that they are not in vital connection with him, that man has a special work to do for God, he must separate from these men, whatever his position and experience, even if he has to walk as did Enoch, with God alone. The Lord God is a host, and all who are in his servants will realize his words to, to Zerubbabel, saying, 
not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Sharp testimonies must be born. Testimonies that reveal sin. It is often difficult to make the impression upon human minds that must be made to enable them to distinguish sacred eternal interests from common things. The witness for God often repeats truth clearly and distinctly. And he thinks, there is no more to be said now. But there are those who, like Simon Magus, think that the sacred things of God are merchandise. There are learned men who, like Nicodemus, say, how can these things be? John 3, verse 9. God's worker is then grieved and astonished. Disappointment comes, and he says, what's the use of working? Clear and striking arguments, illustrations appropriate and right to the point, earnestness and hope to save a soul from death, all have failed to arouse the benumbed senses. Because of the failure of his efforts, his heart becomes discouraged but this will never do we are to remember that spiritual things are spiritually discerned the carnal mind is as dark as midnight and its illumination must come from the holy spirit not by might nor by power but by my spirit saith the lord of hosts the most simple representation will be the most effective. This work is to be done by every believing child of God. None are to fail or be discouraged in the service of their master. Whatever the ignorance of spiritual things is shown by learned men. The key statement in this paragraph we are to remember that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Is this in keeping with Miller's rules? Yes, it is. So if it is in keeping with Miller's rules, when we are making a, an application of an example in a spiritual manner. Are we to make a literal application for it? All spiritual things will be seen in a literal manner. But if we are observing a spiritual presentation, if we are observing something that is a figurative representation for our time, are we to apply that figurative representation in a literal manner? No, I don't hope so. We need to be considering this, brothers and sisters, as we continue in our studies. We are to remember that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. It would be nice if we would look and find a literal application because that makes so much more sense 
to our carnal minds. But if we are to remember that spiritual things are spiritually discerned, then we need to lift our eyes up, not down. Now, as we're coming to the close of our time together today, do we have any other questions, comments, or thoughts that we should address at this time? Yeah, brother. Delight. Yes. You Could you repeat what you said about spiritual and literal again? Okay. If we are to remember that spiritual things are spiritually discerned, when we are studying and we are making a spiritual application in one part of a study and a literal application in another, I am asking if we should be combining the spiritual and the literal together or if we should be looking that a spiritual application should be applied throughout. We know yeah. that we, excuse me, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, you keep on breaking up. I can't, I didn't even get half of what you said. I'm sorry. I don't know uh, if it's you sound you sounded fine, Dwight. So okay. it has to be on, on uh, William's part. I'm sorry that it's not coming through clearly, Brother William. That's all right. No, it's not because I I don't wish to leave you with a question. Well, I don't I don't know if it's you or me, this <laughs> reason it's probably me. Throughout this, we have yet much to discern, much to find in our studies. Our daily studies have been of great importance, for they have been pointing out multiple items that we need to consider in this work in which we are engaged. We are being awakened. We are being shown that which we need to understand for this time in Earth's history. We need this illumination, which can come only from the Holy Spirit. We need to, uh, to look that the most simple representations will be the most effective. We are to remember that spiritual things are to be spiritually discerned. Shall we close with prayer? <clears throat> Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these kind reminders to us today of our great need of you. We ask, Father, for your blessing on this Sabbath day. We ask for your guidance, for your forgiveness of our sins, that your Holy Spirit may open to our minds the things of your word so that we may also be able to impart these truths to others. 
so that we may again be filled with your spirit. Direct us this day. I thank you for all that participated. I thank you for all that will hear these messages later. Be with us now. Help us to walk in the path that you would have us to walk. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.